Yes. And let me do that with your iPad as well. Gracias. Not a problem. All How right. Well can there. you hear me? Can you hear me well or not really? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you good from there. Okay, awesome. Share content. Share my screen. Start broadcast. All righty. Okay, let's wait for that to clear up. All right, just give me one more second to get my pencil here. Okay. So what we're going to talk about uh, a little bit this afternoon is what's known as uh, ST mimics, or more particularly, uh, pathological conditions that look like an ST segment elevation uh, MI, but aren't a uh, ST segment elevation MI. Now, I want you to keep in mind um, just really quickly, I want to verify that everyone can hear me. Chris, can you still hear me and I'm, com I'm coming through well? Yes. Okay, awesome. So I want you to keep in mind that these EKG changes that you see are, are, are even though they're not MIs, they are and they can be uh, dangerous and even lethal to your patient. Um, so when you see uh, things that we're going to talk about, like benign uh, or um, left ventricular hydroperfy or hyperkalemia or things of that nature, um, although they're not an MI in and of themselves, uh, they are and can be dangerous. They can be lethal. They just are not indicative of an acute uh, coronary artery occlusion. Okay. So that's the first thought I want you to keep in mind. Just because it is not a STEMI doesn't mean it's not dangerous and that it won't harm your patient. The second thing that I would like you to keep in mind, the second thought I'd like you to keep in mind is that the most common cause of ST segment elevation is not an acute myocardial infarction. Okay, so when you see ST segment elevation, the most common cause is not a STEMI. All right, and we'll, we'll talk about the common causes of a, uh, the more common causes of ST segment elevation as we move on. Okay, so really quickly, I want to help you remember what the causes of, you know, what can cause ST segment elevation, but not be um, uh, an actual STEMI or a acute myocardial infarction. And the way you remember that, I'm gonna give you sort of a mnemonic here to help you remember. And that mnemonic is incredibly appropriate, uh, is elevation. So this is how you're going to remember the things that can cause ST segment elevation that are not a myocardial infarction. So the first one would be electrolytes. Specifically, hyperkalemia. Oops, that's not that Chris and his chemistry mind will kill me for doing that. Let's do this. Let's be more proper. Is that good with you, Chris? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> All right. The second one, the L, would be left bundle branch block. And actually, it can also be right bundle branch block, but left bundle branch block is more common. 
The third would be early repolarization. All right. The fourth would be ventricular hydroperfy. Hypertrophy. The next one is an aneurysm. And we're not really gonna, we're not really gonna talk about an aneurysm, but just know that uh, in certain cases, an aneurysm can cause, um, specifically a dissecting aortic aneurysm, can cause uh, in some cases, ST segment elevation. This next one is kind of for the sake of the, um, Mnemonic, which is uh, the T is actually uh, treatment, but it is treatment for pericardial tamponade, which would be uh, pericardial synthesis. Okay, so actually sticking a, a needle in the pericardial sac <clears throat> can cause ST segment elevation. Of course, the obvious one, the I, ischemia and injury, which again, we're not, talk, we're, we're not talking about injury because that is myocardial infarction. The next one is Osborne waves. Um, and that is associated with hypothermia. The next one and the final one would be what's known as non-occlusive vasospasm, which is things like your Prinz metal angina. Okay, so this uh, mnemonic should help you remember what uh, the causes of ST segment elevation are that are not associated with an acute myocardial infarction. Uh, again, we're not going to talk about um, we're not going to talk about uh, like Prinz metal's angina, and we're not going to talk about uh, aortic dissection. So that's going to bring me to our first one that we are going to talk about, which is our benign early repolarization syndrome, or benign I should just say benign early repolarization. Now, what you need to know about benign uh, early repolarization, uh, if we think about it again, it's not malignant, it's not pathological, it, uh, it is benign, which means it's not really causing any harm, okay? So things to need, uh, you need to remember. And again, let me, let me go back real quick and give you, again, my, uh, Hierarchy of necessity. If I were to put this on my hierarchy of necessity, where we talk about, you know, where you absolutely need to know, uh, and then uh, what would be nice to know, and finally, what would, you know, what a, what would a know-it-all know, I would have to say that this kind of falls in between the need to know and nice to know. What... Um, I would put as, or I would define as need to know is this, that not all ST segment elevation is indicative of an MI, okay, of an acute MI. That is something that you absolutely need to know. So anytime that you see uh, ST segment elevation, you don't go screaming, this is an MI, this is an MI. Other things cause ST segment elevation. Okay, so that's the need to know part. The nice to know is these particular conditions that we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Um, that is the nice to know. And I, I, I'm saying that in um, terms of real world practice and uh, national registry, I'm not speaking in terms of a, an exam that Chris could give you because I bet you some of this will show up on an exam. So, but if you're, you know, you're looking to parse out the limited time that you have, the exact causes are nice to know, but the fact that um, other things besides acute myocardial infarction cause STEMI is definitely a need to know. 
All right, so again, let's go back to benign early repolarization. Uh, it is a very, oh, I, I would say it's a fairly common, I wouldn't say it's very common, but it's a fairly common uh, condition. Uh, looking at the American Heart Association, some of the literature, it suggests that between 10 and 13% of the population actually suffer from this phenomenon. It is most commonly found in patients less than 50 years old. Uh, it uh, is commonly found in athletes. And the key here is, you know, how do we determine it? How do we, you know, uh, how do we determine the presence of this phenomenon? And that is the ST segment morphology, the ST segment shape is going to be the best way to determine the presence of this phenomenon. And uh, in order to determine it, we're going to look at two things to look for uh, primarily. The first is going to be a notched J point. So if you look at your Chris's notes here, where he has notch J point, the arrow is pointing to, you see the notch there, the notch there, that's your J point. So that is the first key is a notch J point. The second key is going to be the absence of reciprocal changes. Okay, so if you have ST segment elevation, but, and you look at contiguous leads, so let's say we have, you know, uh, ST segment elevation in two, in two, three, and AVF. So what would our contiguous leads be there? So in other words, where would we want to look for our reciprocal changes to determine whether they are present and whether this is an MI versus something else? Anyone? One AVF. Yeah, one in AVF, absolutely. So you're looking at one in AVF or B1 and AVL. If you see, you know, you have a elevated ST segment in two, three in AVF, and then you have what looks like an inverted T wave in one in AVL, you're looking for at reciprocal changes. And I'm sure Chris has already discussed that at nauseum. So uh, if you need to review what, uh, reciprocal changes are, please do. Okay, and so those are the two things we're going to look for primarily. There is a third. There is a third thing that we look for, and that is going to be a concaved ST segment, all right? So a concave ST segment as opposed to an elevated ST segment. So let's get V2. We have concaved ST segments, and if you think about it, that concave ST segment kind of actually looks like you know, a smiley face. If your ST segment does this sort of smiley face thing, chances are um, it is not uh, ST segment elevation MI. It's more than likely benign repolarization. Okay, so what are my take home points there? Uh, that benign repolarization, it is, com it is relatively common, but not excessively common. In order to uh, identify it, you're going to look at the shape of your ST segment, that's the best way to determine it. And you're gonna be looking primarily for, for two things and you know peripherally a third, which is number one, look for your notch J point. Number two, look for the absence of reciprocal changes uh, in your reciprocal leads. And number three, look for your concaved ST segment. Chris, anything you'd like to add? No, that's great. Um, the only thing I'd say is anytime you see concave ST, to, um, ST elevation, um, you should be thinking about a mimic. Yes, absolutely. You will, yeah, you'll see this pop up time and time again. So yeah, anytime you see that, you'd be like, huh, I wonder if something else is going on. Okay. All right. So let's talk about, uh, let's move on to our next uh STEMI mimic, uh, and that would be pericarditis. So what is pericarditis? Well, pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardial sac, okay? So, and it could be bacterial or it could be viral. Uh, usually when you have pericarditis, uh, it will manifest in three stages of change on the EKG. And I should, I, I should have gone ahead and drawn this ahead of time. 
I'm not really going to, to try to draw it here now because I'm just not the same kind of artist that Chris is. But I will tell you, there's usually, you see three stages of change. Uh, and maybe you can mentally think about this or we can revisit this when we look at our, our EKG that's coming up. But usually in stage one, you'll end up seeing a concaved ST segment. Um, and again, think about that, that kind of smiley face, um, your ST segment initially in stage one. So in the beginning, when the person first gets ill, usually that uh, ST segment will actually concave. Um, and then in stage two, you will end up seeing something called, uh, well, PR segment depression. Um, and again, we'll talk about that in just a second. And in the third and final stage, after you get your elevation of your ST segment, you uh, can get this inverted T wave. So I will tell you that there are three things that we look for when we start considering whether you know, a patient is suffering from acute pericarditis. First and foremost, you're gonna look at their history. Um, do, you know, do they have any past history of uh, cardiac surgery? You know, has someone been in their chest recently? Have they had a uh, history of some other um, infection, uh, sepsis or what have you? So first uh, you're gonna look at your history. The second thing that you're gonna look for is when you do your EKG, in pericarditis, you will see ST segment uh, elevation uh, either globally, that means in all of your leads. So if we look at this EKG, we see ST segment elevation in two, we see ST segment uh, elevation in three, we see ST segment elevation uh, in your V leads, we see it in V5 and V6. So that's gonna be global ST segment elevation that's going to you know, clue you in that, hey, um, you, uh, in a STEMI, unless we're talking about one that is extended, usually we don't see ST segment elevation in all leads, unless we're talking about a global MI. So that's gonna be your first um, clue, or you will see ST segment elevation in leads that just don't make sense, leads that are not contiguous. Um, so instead of just seeing ST segment elevation in two, three, and ABF, you may see, ST segment elevation in two and V6 and V1, you know, v, uh, and you go, well, wait a minute, those aren't necessarily contiguous leads, but I see ST segment elevation in all of them. So, you know, that would clue you in that perhaps this is uh, a pericarditis. The, so uh, again, first clue, global ST segment elevation, uh, in all leads or in leads that are not contiguous or, sent, or leads that don't make sense. The second thing I don't really, you know, I'm not sure I should talk about, but I am just going to touch on it for a second. It's something called Spodex sign, okay? And Spodex sign, let's see if I see it here in the EKG. I don't necessarily, well, and what spotic sign is, is a downward trend of the isoelectric line. Okay, so what am I talking about? Well, a downward trend of the isoelectric line, if we look at it, we'll say, okay, well, this is the isoelectric line. All right, so the T to P uh, is the isoelectric line. The isoelectric line, if you remember, is where the uh, EKG tracing returns to baseline. Okay, in pericarditis, you can actually appreciate this down, a downward trend in your isoelectric line. And that is known, if, as you move through the leads, you'll see this downward trend. That is known as spotic sign, okay? The downward trend of the isoelectric line. So that is indicator number two. And a third indicator that I would suggest is how your pain is manifesting itself. You know, is your pain constant or is the pain of this, pa this chest pain this patient is having, if they're having chest pain, is it positional? So what am I talking about? You know, if you have your patient say, sit up in a semi fowler's position or a high fowler's position, and that makes the pain worse uh, along with your other signs, that, you know, that means that the heart is kind of leaning forward and touching that sac and getting aggravated and that increases your chest pain. So those are, are the three keys 
uh, to uh, you know, having a working diagnosis of pericarditis versus a STEMI. I don't want to say a, a diagnosis because some folks get kind of funny about paramedics making a diagnosis. So we'll just call it a working diagnosis. So the take home points there are if you're, you know, considering whether your patient, uh, whether your patient is suffering from a ST segment uh, elevation mimic for pericarditis, uh, you are going to first and foremost, uh, consider where the elevation is happening, what leads is happening in. Is it global? You know, is it happening in every lead or is it happening in lead that doesn't make sense? Uh, second, consider spot exon. Do you have a constant downward trend of the isoelectric line? And finally, you know, is the pain the patient is experiencing, is it positional? Um, one of the things that you'll, you'll see a lot of times in stage uh, two, uh, where you have your PR segment depression. Uh, PR segment depression, just a little piece of trivia here. You normally see more of a PR segment depression in patients that are suffering from a uh, viral pericarditis versus a bacterial pericarditis. So that's just a little piece of trivia there. So Chris, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, just one quick thing, um, and this is just a really good point when it comes to a patient assessment. Um, another finding that we see with pericarditis, it, you can see with pericarditis, is something called a, a rub, a pericardial friction rub. And you will listen, you'll appreciate heart tones, and you'll hear this rubbing associated with the heart tones uh, as you have that inflamed uh, pericardium. And so this is uh, something I would strongly recommend you make a part of your physical exam is listening to heart tones on all patients that have uh, potential cardiovascular complaints. Uh, not only can you detect other uh, valvular anomalies, but um, this may also point you in the direction of a pericarditis. And yeah, that's all I've got there. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Uh, this particular uh, pathology uh, has caused a, many a death. Um, it is an extremely dangerous uh, reentry uh, type of phenomenon. Um, and what causes Wolf-Parkinson-White is so you have your initiation of your electrical impulse. We know, uh, if we remember from our, our fundamental EKG and electrophysiology lecture, uh, your impulse is initiated in your SA node, uh, and then it moves down through the atria into the AV node, and it is held up uh, momentarily, um, which is the actual PR segment. It's held up momentarily to allow the ventricles to fully uh, fully fill, so you get um, uh, adequate cardiac output. So that impulse is held up by the AV node, and then in, it is released and it propagates down into the ventricles. Well, in the case of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, what is actually happening is that that electrical impulse is taking an accessory pathway. An accessory pathway is uh, has been created in a location called the bundle of Kent. And this impulse is actually taking this accessory pathway, bypassing the AV node and moving uh, right into the ventricles. So what ends up happening is you actually uh, don't allow time for your ventricles to fill. Uh, that's one side effect. But uh, more importantly, uh, this particular phenomenon can lead to some tachyarrhythmias. So really quickly, let's talk about, you know, again, uh, your Wolf Parkinson White, the first thing you're going to look for is a shortened PR interval. So can someone tell me what a regular PR interval is again? And I know you, uh, you've been asked this time and time again, but again, repetition is the key here to becoming facile at looking at EKGs and 12 leads. So what's your normal PR interval? Three to five boxes. How many? Uh, three to five boxes. Yeah, three to five boxes. So 
uh, between uh, 120 and 200 milliseconds, okay, uh, is a normal PR interval. Well, in the case of wolf practicing white, remember this electrical impulse is taking a shortcut. And as a consequence of taking the shortcut, you have this uh, shortened PR interval. So if we look at lead two here in Chris's notes, you'll see this shortened PR interval. So look at lead two here. You know, that's a, that's a, a severely shortened PR interval, almost non-existent, right? Okay, so that's the first thing we're gonna look for is a, our shortened PR interval. The next classic finding on our Wolf Parkinson White uh, EKG is you are going to look for something called a delta wave. And this little, see that little protuberance there, it's best seen in the three, I think here, is known as a delta wave, okay? So that delta wave uh, is a consequence of this shortened pathway. And then finally, a third hallmark characteristic of your Wolf Parkinson White EKG is these widened, and it's best seen here in lead two again, these widened QRSs. AVF also, okay, you have these widened QRSs. So that is uh, a hallmark 12 lead EKG indicative of Parkinson and White syndrome. So our take home points there are, you know, the characteristics of, of this 12 lead is number one, you're gonna have a shortened PR interval. Number two, you're gonna have the presence of a delta wave. And three, uh, you'll have a widened QRS. Well, you know, you ask, well, what's so dangerous about Wolf Parkinson White syndrome? Well, as I alluded to uh, in the beginning of this, Wolf Parkinson White often leads to lethal reentry uh, tachycardias. Um, and uh, what's so, you know, dangerous about these tachycardias is number one, these tachycardias uh, tend to be resistant to any pharmacological pharmacological treatment that we would provide. In fact, some of the medications that we would give to treat a tachycardia, um, amiodarone, adenosine, can actually cause this patient to uh, revert into a, a lethal ventricular arrhythmia. And this ventricular arrhythmia, once they go into it, it's very, very hard to, you know, it's refractory to treatment. It's very, very hard to get them to convert uh, away from this rhythm. So that's what is so dangerous about this Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And that is, you know, uh, one of the key reasons that we try to identify it and that we, you know, will limit uh, what we use pharmacologically uh, to prevent them from going into a lethal arrhythmia. Again, adenosine, uh, amiodarone, and the like. So, Chris, anything you'd like to add here? No, that's 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 uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, I will tell you this. The next uh, thing we're going to talk about is our digoxin effect. And I will tell you, just you know, in my career, I, I, I told you once before that I was a cardiac monitor tech. And when you're sitting up on a floor with a bunch of cardiac transplant patients or other cardiac patients in step-down units, and you see these folks on a myriad of drugs, um, and one of the drugs we hated uh, most was digoxin, because digoxin will get the heart to do anything under the sun. And you can see some of the weirdest uh, EKG changes associated with digoxin. So the nice thing is that digoxin uh, is kind enough to uh, the digoxin effect, we call it, is nice enough to um, manifest itself uh, with some very characteristic uh, EKG findings, some very classic EKG findings. Now, one of the things I will, you know, want to impress upon you is just because you see EKG findings and you discover, you know, through your history and physical that your patient is on digoxin, it does, you know, those EKG findings 
is, is not in any way indicative of, hey, whether your patient is uh, toxic uh, on digoxin or whether they've reached a therapeutic level on digoxin or whether, you know, the digoxin is doing what it's supposed to do or it's not doing what it's supposed to do, okay? Uh, and that is because digoxin is, its therapeutic effect, it's what we call it, the therapeutic range is very narrow from one patient to another where one patient, you know, you'll put on digoxin at a certain dose and it'll do what it's supposed to do. You put another patient on that very same dose and all of a sudden, you know, the, patient, the uh, patient's heart loses their mind and all of a sudden starts throwing all this ectopy or goes into this weird rhythm that you don't, you know, that you've never seen before. So I want you to keep that in mind just because your patient says, hey, I'm on digoxin and you, you look at the EKG and the EKG looks weird. Um, you know, um, what is it? Uh, correlation does not necessitate causation. So just because they're on digoxin, that just may be, you know, a um, correlative uh, effect and not necessarily causing your patient to have arrhythmias or it, it might, okay? So I just wanted to keep that in mind. Uh, one of the other characteristic findings, uh, you know, in the uh, digoxin effect is something we call this ice cream scoop, you know, where you have this ST segment that looks kind of like an ice cream scoop. You have this uh, ST segment depression. It is typically seen in multiple leads. Um, and Chris, I have never, uh, I, I've never seen the Dolly or heard of even Dolly's mustache. Now, of course, I've heard of Salvador Dolly, uh, but never that finding. So can you uh, enlighten us? Yeah, so um, his mustache, if you look at look up pictures of Salvador Dali, he has this mustache that looks like a little ice cream scoops, little little black thin ice cream scoops on each side of his nose. So I kind of drew a little picture. Um, actually, then that little picture that I put in your notes is is kind of shamelessly stolen from a, a diagram. And so I actually gave him a goatee in that picture for uh, just to avoid copyright, uh, he never had a goatee, as far as I, I'm aware. But he had these little thin, these little thin hair hairline mustache that came out of his nose that that kind of looks like an ice cream scoop. And so that's just a memory aid I threw in there to say, hey, think of a Salvador Dali mustache, and that's kind of what that that ST depression looks like, um, or characteristically looks like uh, with digoxin. Okay, thanks, Chris. Okay, if we move down and we look at our 12 lead example of uh, digoxin effect, uh, one of the, you know, the hallmark uh, medical conditions that folks have that are on digoxin are, um, is atrial fibrillation. A lot of your, your patients, you know, they feel like, uh, cardiologists feel like, you know, you haven't treated this uh, atrial fibrillation until you throw a little bit of digoxin at it. So uh, in your history, you know, patient that says, hey, I'm on, uh, you know, I, I'm on digoxin, and you look and you see that they have AFib, that, you know, kind of makes sense. But so one of the classic findings before you even look at the EKG is uh, a patient that has a past medical history of AFib. And then again, if we look um, at this uh, 12 lead, we see that this is a specific type of AFib. Uh, it's known as AFib with controlled ventricular response. I'm sure Chris has discussed that with you. Controlled ventricular response has to do with rate. Um, there is a controlled ventricular response or what we call, you know, our, um, AFib with controlled ventricular response and uncontrolled ventricular response, which would be a more tachycardic AFib, okay? Uh, and if we look at this 12 lead, we see, again, classic findings, that ice cream scoop effect of the ST segment, ice cream scoop effect again. Uh, in lead two, uh, it, again, we look over in V4, same thing. You know, you see this, wanna, this. Yes, go ahead. Can you please zoom in the picture, if you don't mind? What's that? Can you please zoom in that? Oh, sure, that, uh, sure. Go. Sorry. How about that? Perfect. Okay, so again, when we're talking about this ice cream scoop, we're talking about this classic depressed ST segment. And we see that throughout 
this uh, 12 lead EKG. And we also, again, appreciate that this person is in an AFib with control ventricular response. So, you know, those taken together, we can reasonably uh, create a working diagnosis of a patient who uh, may be suffering from the digoxin effect as opposed to a STEMI. All right. So let me really quickly, there's something I meant to mention in your uh, intro, which is these findings are, are, are sometimes very nuanced and uh, you're very early in your practice and very early in your training. So I would caution you, you know, of course we, again, we say that these are, are some of them are, are need to know, some of them are nice to know, but I would caution you, you know, if you can't differentiate one from the other, which I don't expect that you will be able to in this brief time that we talk about this, or even, uh, you know, um, become that discerning while, while you're here training, if you have any doubt at all, um, I don't want you to get overly concerned about your reputation at this point with the facility. You know, I don't want to call something uh, an MI that's not an MI, that's an MI imposter. I don't want to look stupid. I will tell you that it is far, far, far more, um, it's far better for you to call something an MI and you treat it as such than in than the inverse that you, you know, have a patient that's having an MI and you don't identify it or you identify it as something else as one of the imposters and you get to the hospital and they're actually having NMI. Okay. So uh, bottom line, when in doubt, treat it as if, as if it is an MI. If you hear hoof beats and all you know are horses, then think horses, not zebra. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Our next imposter would be uh, hyperthermia, someone who is suffering from hyperthermia, uh, specifically, or more particularly, someone suffering from a moderate to severe hyperthermia. And if you look at your notes, there are your definitions, your lines of deline delineation between mild, moderate, and severe. Someone who is suffering from hyperthermia can present with EKG changes, that will uh, elevate your ST segment elevate um, elevate your ST segment elevation and may make you think, hey, this person is having an MI. All right, but again, the first key to determining or or to making this determination is look at your patient's history. You know, if your patient is sitting on a porch in seventy degree weather, um, and you pull a, a EKG from them it's probably not the best thing, you know, it's probably not reasonable to think, okay, we're dealing with hypothermia here. Likewise, uh, if you pull your patient out of a frozen pond or you pull your patient out of the desert um, where, you know, your temperature is 30 degrees or so, you know, I mean, it could be as little as 50 degrees. Um, and all of a sudden you're seeing uh, this ST segment elevation, well, hyperthermia may be one of the considerations uh, that you want to keep in your differentials. So first and foremost, key to identifying this phenomenon is your patient history. Second is a hallmark finding of uh, your hypothermic 12 lead, which would be what's called an Osborne wave. Okay. So our, our, I should say the presence of a J wave or Osborne wave. Now, if we look here at the ST segment elevation, look at how that, this little swoop here actually kind of looks like a J, okay? So that is classic. That is a classic finding for a patient that is suffering from hypothermia. Now, a lot of times these patients, you have to remember that uh, these patients are cold. They're going to be shivering. It is fairly difficult to uh, actually get uh, a clean EKG on these folks. But if you're lucky enough and you see this, uh, you know, you, they're suffering from a moderate to severe hypothermia. Now, what is, you know, so dangerous about this is these patients are, you know, their threshold for lethal dysrhythmias 
is next to nothing. I mean, you can move or shake these patients and they run the risk of going into an ATAC or uh, a ventricular tachycardia or a VFib or, um, you know, an AFib, a, a really, really fast uh, AFib that is very, very hard to break them out of, regardless of what pharmacology you use. A lot of times these patients will not convert until you actually uh, engage in some active warming uh, and uh, then hit them with some pharmacology and they typically re will respond to it. Okay, so Chris, how about cleaning up that for me? No, that, that, that sounds great. And if you go back up and look at the, um, the uh, ST uh, segment changes, you'll also notice that there is, there is uh, some uh, uh, concave elevation there. Um, and so that kind of continues this theme of, oh, concave ST elevation. Um, maybe I don't know exactly what's going on because there are lots of mimics as you're beginning to see, but I see that this elevation just doesn't look like the classic ST elevation I'm used to seeing. Maybe I should think about um, uh, one of the mimics. Oh, excellent. Okay, is everybody good or do, do we need a break? Maybe, you know, five, 10 minutes or so. I don't wanna to run too long. So you guys speak up, tell me how you're doing. Anybody need a, a quick break? Anyone, anyone, Bueller? I feel, I feel good, but I don't know about everybody else. Somebody else chime in here. Anybody need I'm a good. break? Good. You're good. All right. Okay. You need to so, go till 1400. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know me, Chris, my tongue okay. loves to wag. I can't. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. We'll go, we'll go, we'll go out to the top of the hour and then take a little break. Okay. So now let's talk about our next, our next, uh, STEMI mimic. And that would be left ventricular hydroperfy, uh, known as LVH. Okay. So Let's talk a little bit about first the pathophysiology of left ventricular hydroperfusion because this is one of those things that got me when I was a paramedic. Um, you know, I was like, well, well, wouldn't the the heart, you know, you work in the heart muscle, make it stronger and make it better, uh, you know? And and uh, one of my friends who was in medical school was like, no, Ronell, you obviously don't understand uh, ventricular hydroperfusion. So let's talk about that for a second. So what do we mean when we say hypertrophy or hydroperfy, however you want to pronounce it, potato, potato? What does that mean? The muscle's enlarged? Yeah, the muscle gets enlarged. Um, uh, if you think about an example of you going to the gym, you know, and building your muscles, I, I personally haven't been there in a while. I don't even remember where my gym is, but Chris religiously goes at 3 a.m. every morning, makes me feel bad. Um, Chris, just know that I think about you every day at 3 a.m. and then I just roll over and go to sleep and feel bad about myself. But anyway, um, with ventricular hydroperfusion, you have this enlargement of the muscle, you know, so you go, well, hey, wouldn't that be a good thing? Well, actually, no, it's not a good thing. So, you know, you go, hey, well, that's actually an excuse for me not to exercise because when I exercise, doesn't that work out my heart and make my heart muscle stronger? Um, and I'm gonna say, no, not really. Um, we're talking about two different things. So when you're actually, when you actually work out what you're doing, you're not actually working out your heart so much. What you're doing uh, when you work out and you stress your body, you are helping your body to become more efficient at utilizing oxygen. You're raising what's called, and I don't wanna to get too far into it, but your VO2 max. Uh, your, your body actually gets more efficient at using oxygen and it takes it a longer time to move from aerobic metabolism into anaer uh, anaerobic metabolism and start producing lactic acid. Okay, so that's what working out does for you. It doesn't really affect your heart muscle in that it doesn't cause 
uh, hypertrophy because, uh, you know, that's exactly the opposite of what we want to happen when we exercise. If it, if it actually caused hypertrophy, we'd be like, yeah, no, I don't want to exercise because I don't want my heart muscle to thicken. So what is, so that's, you know, that's exercise. Uh, and I just wanted to dispel, you know, if you thought that like I did, dispel that. And now we're, let's talk about what ventricular hydroperfy really is. So forgive my bad artwork. So let's say that you have, um, we're going to call this your left ventricle, because that's where hydroperfy usually occurs initially. So there's your left ventricle, you know, and, and you have all this space for the left ventricle to fill up with, with volume. Well, in left, you know, in ventricular hydroperfy, muscle is not added necessarily to the outside of the ventricle wall. What ends up happening is you actually start getting a thickening and a growing of the muscle inside the ventricular wall. And logically, if your uh, muscle starts to thicken inside the, the uh, ventricular wall, that leaves uh, less and less space for volume, for fluid. So therefore your cardiac output is reduced. Also what ends up happening, um, and if you think about you know, someone who is really bulky, really muscular, a lot of times they're not really flexible. They have all the muscle in the world, but you, know, you ask them to move fast or you know, test their flexibility, they're not very flexible. They tend to be fairly rigid. Same thing occurs when you're talking about ventricular hydroperfy. Because this, you have this thickening of this um, wall muscle, uh, this muscle also becomes stiff. So it doesn't stretch as well. And if it doesn't stretch as well, it doesn't fill as well. If it doesn't fill as well, that reduces your cardiac output. And that really affects, you know, um, Starling's law. Remember, I'm sure, again, Chris is, has covered that with you. But it actually, you know, overall left ventricular hydroperfy reduces the efficiency of the left ventricle and reduces the filling volume of the left ventricle. Okay. So that is a little bit about the pathophysiology of left ventricular hydroperfy. Well, what causes, what are some of the common causes of left ventricular hydroperfy? Well, the most common cause is uh, hypertension. Okay. So uh, what ends up happening there is, you know, you have uh, systemic hypertension where your arteries, um, they have, uh, and your, your arteries actually increase uh, their muscle tone. Uh, and also, you know, you may have plaques or whatever running throughout your, uh, your arteries. And this actually increases uh, your blood pressure. Um, and if you wanna think about it in terms of say, having a garden hose and having water uh, running through a garden hose. And if you pinch that garden hose, your pressure increases. Well, uh, same thing happens here. Pressure of the blood increases. Uh, and not only that, but speaking systemically, let's say you have blood in the left ventricle that needs to move out of the um, aortic valve and into your systemic vasculature. Uh, when you have that as increased pressures, you know, increased blood pressure, um, you have in, uh, increased forces. Um, that is an increased force that the heart has to work against. Uh, remember, when we, when we talk about um, the force that the heart has to work against to push blood out systemically, we're talking about afterload. So basically, what we're saying is high blood pressure increases afterload. So when you have this increase in afterload, the heart has to work harder. And, you know, the consequence of that is hypertrophy, you know, thickening of the heart muscle. So that is your primary cause. Um, aortic dissection, or I'm sorry, aortic or mitral valve issues, such as a aortic valve stenosis. Again, it is the valve that you have to, that has to open in order for blood to move systemically. If that uh, valve is stenotic, if it is not flexible, if it is harder to open, that's gonna increase afterload and your heart's gonna have to work against that. 
Uh, same thing with the mitral valve, where you have mitral valve stenosis, or even what's called mitral valve prolapse, uh, where you um, may actually end up with some, some inflammation that actually increases the force that the blood has to apply against that valve to open. And that will also lead to, you know, um, hydroperfy. All right. So let's see, let's talk about, um, you know, cardiomyopathies, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Basically what we're talking about here is enlargement of the heart. Um, uh, that again, leads to, uh, hy hypertrophy. So, Again, um, our main point here is, you know, ventricular hypertrophy is just increased uh, pressure in the left ventricle. Hypertension is the most common cause. And then, of course, you have the valvular issues. Now, uh, if you really want to think very basically about left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy is nothing more than a repolarization and anomaly uh, that occurs, um, that causes the left ventricle to display this thing called a, a, a strain pattern, a left ventricular strain pattern. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what a left ventricular strain pattern is. And there's a, a couple of ways that you can determine whether this is present. So a left ventricular strain pattern is actually when you have high voltage QRSs that uh, indicates that the, you know, the heart is actually uh, the work of the uh, afterload has been increased uh, through the left ventricle. So if we look at our EKG here, uh, and what we're talking about is something uh, called um, sokolov lyon criteria. Okay, sokolov lyon criteria. And what sokolov lyon criteria tells us is that if you actually take look at the S wave in V1 or V2, you take your deepest S wave in V1 or V2. Hey, Ronnell. Yes. Can you zoom in? I'm sorry. Is that better? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So again, that criteria, um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the number of, count the number of boxes. So it can be v, V1 or V2. You're gonna count the number of boxes and your QRS amplitude. You'll find the one with the highest, you know, with the highest number of boxes. We'll do V1 here, just because this is an example that uh, Chris has given and you count up those boxes. And then you look for the tallest R wave or the highest amplitude R wave in V5 or V6. Chris actually has used V4 here. So we'll go with that. And you'll actually count up your boxes. And if those number of boxes exceeds uh, 35 boxes, or hold on one sec, uh, 30, 35 boxes or 35, I should say, then your patient uh, meets what's called voltage criteria for uh, left ventricular hydroperfy. Now, here's a problem with this with this method that I've run into. Um, I stopped using it a few years ago uh, because I found the different monitors that I use will actually cut off the QRS uh, prematurely. It'll actually cut off the QRS prematurely, and so I couldn't determine. You know, I couldn't see clearly the number of boxes. So what I learned to do is did I use a two-step process? Number one, well, does your EKG have high voltage? Uh, and of course, that requires that you know what normal voltage is. Uh, and number two, uh, is your EKG exhibiting a strain pattern? Now, what do we talk about? What do we mean when we talk about, you know, a strain pattern? So in order to appreciate what a strain pattern is, we have to understand something, a concept called T wave discordance, okay? T wave discordance. Can somebody take a guess of what? Just, just uh, you know, I talked about if you can break down the words uh, in medicine, you can a lot of times kind of ferret out exactly what's going on 
uh, pathologically or physiologically. So someone take a stab at it for me. What do you think T wave discordance is? Uncoordinated. Looking at Google. Go ahead. Hello? Anybody out there? He had said uncoordinated. Okay, so what, what's uncoordinated? Is the T wave and the QRS phase in different directions? Absolutely, absolutely. That's T wave discordance. So that means T wave discordance means that the T wave and the QRS are pointing actually in different directions. So let's take a look at V1, V2, V1, V2, and V3, which are our right precordial leads. Okay, and do we see T wave dis um, uh, do we see T wave discordance? And yes, we do, because you look at it in V1 and note that your QRS is pointing downward and your T wave is pointing is pointing upward. Or to use more uh, appropriate terms, your T wave has a positive deflection and your QRS has a negative deflection. Okay, so that is what's called T wave discordance. Okay, if you see this, if you see appreciate this T wave discordance, as well as if you determine, hey, um, my voltage is here in millivolts, uh, my QRS voltage is higher than normal, then you can be fairly certain that left ventricular hydroperfy is present. Okay, all right. So, what are my take home points here? Uh, right along with my, you know, with my, the main idea, um, left ventricular hydroperfy can cause or does cause ST segment elevation. Uh, left ventricular hydroperfy is nothing more than a thickening of the uh, left ventricle uh, of the heart. Now, keep in mind, when you have left ventricular hydroperfy, you can also have right ventricular hydroperfy. And that makes sense because we're talking about, you know, uh, a system, everything is connected. If your heart, if your left side of your heart is pushing against, you know, a greater force, sooner or later, your right side of your heart's gonna feel that, okay? Especially in the presence uh, of a medical condition called core palm and all. So, all right. Chris, anything you want to clean up there, I'm sure. No, no, that's that's fantastic, and this is a it's a fairly common finding, um, and it, it, you you can see uh, again like a lot of these things, you know, it's, it's fairly um, nuanced when it comes to uh, diagnosing it, um, and so uh, again, uh, we just want you to be thinking more broadly, like, hey, does the history and physical exam match what I'm seeing on the twelve lead? And if it doesn't, you need to start thinking about uh, different uh, kinds of mimics. Um, and then what are the different criteria that we use to uh, rule in or rule out some of these mimics? And, and many of these mimics, LVH, for example, really the definitive diagnosis is going to uh, require modalities that are really beyond what we can typically do um, outside of the hospital environment. So echocardiography, for example, is kind of the definitive uh, way of diagnosing a left ventricular hypertrophy. So um, we're you know, providing you with some tools, uh, but again, um, we're not expecting you to uh, have a perfect uh, uh, ability to uh, diagnose this per se. Um, did you want to take a quick break, Brunel, or Absolutely, yeah. Let's give them a quick break. Sounds good. All right, folks, we'll see you back here. The time is now 14.05. We'll see you back here at 14.15. Hey, Ronell. 
Yes, big guy. What's up? Hey, um, I know, um, I know that the bundle branch blocks are coming up a little later on. Um, hey, can I get you to cover those? Sure. Uh, I was just yeah. going to say, um, as far as Scarbosas and all that, um, I was thinking maybe we could shelve that until next week. I figured, yeah. How about, yeah. I figured, I looked at it, I was like, oh, I wonder if we should go into Scarbosa criteria. Yeah. But I'll let you cover that. Okay, because I actually, I, you, I do something a little different yeah. now than when I made these notes. There's kind of modified criteria that's a little easier. Yep, a little yep. Better. Um, I know, yep. Okay, I'll I let think, you touch on it. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll just kind of, we'll we'll push that till next week and we'll just um, kind of just mention, hey, there's some criteria that's used and we'll go more hands-on with uh, some of that next week um, since this this week is more a uh more a focus on um the basic analysis exactly. of the exactly yeah okay. i totally agree um i will touch on of course i don't want to go i was looking at brigada syndrome i see in your notes there and i just, I'm, I just kind of mention it just yeah. do a light handling because yeah. you know it's fairly Something rare about. you're talking yeah, about rare you know, like one in 10,000, five in 10,000, something like that was the last literature I read. So, and there are like but three major subtypes of it and they each have different characters. Yeah, there's a type one and type two. So yeah, I, I'm just going to hit on it really lightly. Okay, is that Perfect. all right with you? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect, okay. yeah. All right, let's continue. Uh, the next STEMI mimic that we want to address is going to be hyperkalemia. Okay. Um, and it, let's remember that electrolyte imbalances um, have profound effects on the heart, not just potassium, but other electrolytes as well. Um, but uh, in particular, hyperkalemia or uh, potassium imbalance uh, probably has the most profound effect. Uh, on the heart. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about it. So let's, uh, you know, we need to remember that hyperkalemia uh, in our EKG, it kind of presents on a continuum. It kind of happens uh, sort of in stages. That, in other words, the changes that you'll see uh, happen on a continuum. And to help you remember, I want you to think about, let's say, Let's look at this, you know, this complex right here. If you want to think about what hyperkalemia as it progresses, what it will do to the EKG, just think about, you know, you have a, a visualize, you have a little man over here and you have a little man over here and they grab a hold of this, you know, like this is a rope. One of these guys grabs a hold of one end of it and one of the guys grabs a hold to the other end of the rope and they pull it. And, you know, as they pull it, naturally, uh, the QRS or this rope is going to stretch out. You know, it's going to actually stretch out. Uh, and this is actually, you know, analogous to kind of what happens uh, as hyperkalemia progresses on an EKG. So let's talk a little bit um, about, you know, I like to call these the stages of hyperkalemia. And these stages are associated with uh, what your serum potassium levels are in your blood. So typically the first thing you're gonna see uh, as the person, you know, as the patient moves into a mild hyperkalemia, mild being defined as, you know, uh, hyperkalemia of uh, 5.5 to 6.5, really quickly, let me, let me um, in order for you to know what high K is, we have to know what a normal K typically is. And I will admit that this value actually, you know, changes from lab to lab, but in general, there's a, 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 a generally accepted normal level of potassium in the body. And can someone give me that range? Does anybody know what a normal potassium, where it falls, what the range would be? Is it 3.5 to 5? Yeah, 3.5 to 5. Again, you may see some labs say 3.2 to 5.1, what have you. But it's generally in the neighborhood of 3 to 5, okay? So 
anything you know above 5.5 is going to be considered a mild hyperkalemia okay so in this instance mild hyperkalemia again is defined as uh, anything from 5.5 to 6.5 um, milliequivalents is considered a mild hyperkalemia. And the EKG changes uh, that we typically see with that, if we see any at all, is going to be uh, first your kind of peaked T wave right here, that kind of peaked T wave. And then it's kind of hard to see here, but, uh, and also as you know, those guys pull on this QR, on this complex, you're going to start to see a prolonged PR segment. Okay. So think about it. The, you know, the first stage, mild hyperkalemia uh, manifest, manifestations on the 12 lead are going to be peak T waves uh, associated with a prolonged PR segment. And then as you progress, and the serum potassium gets higher, you move into a moderate hyperkalemia, which is defined you know, here as a 6.5 to eight. The EKG changes that you will start to appreciate, again, those guys pulling, uh, you'll see not only does that PR, that PR interval has it elongated, but you get this disappearance, this loss of a P wave, okay? The, the P wave goes away. And then you will start to see a widening of the QRS complex. That QRS complex will become widened. The ST segment will start to elevate. Okay. And then uh, you may also begin to appreciate some ventricular activity, PVCs, you know, multifocal PVCs, runs of of uh, uh, salvos, runs of VTAC. It all depends on, you know, how tolerant the patient is to this elevated potassium. Someone who is, you know, has no other past medical history, 35 year old, um, for whatever reason, uh, has hyperkalemia, they're probably going to be able to tolerate this higher K than say, a patient who is 85. I will tell you in most cardiac patients, uh, patients who have a cardiac history, uh, cardiology, uh, cardiologists typically like to keep that level right around four. Okay. Anything higher than that, they go hyperkalemia, anything lower than that, they, you know, start shooting for hype, um, hypokalemia. So again, moderate, you know, once you have that moderate hyperkalemia, uh, you hallmark signs again, loss of a P wave, prolonged QRS complex and your ST segment elevation, and that could or could not be followed by um, your ectopic beats or perhaps even some escape rhythms. And then finally, as you know, that uh, potassium becomes you know much higher than an eight milli equivalents, you'll see this this progressive widening uh, of the QRS until it reverts into something called a sine wave, and that is you know right here is a classic example of what a sine wave is. Um, those of you that may take electronics, you see that on an oscilloscope. Uh, well, the heart can do that too if you get the potassium up high enough. Uh, and then that is usually followed by a ventricular fibrillation uh, as, you know, as our uh, hyperkalemia gets worse, the heart becomes more exposed uh, to the high K levels. You'll see that QRS continue to stretch out, continue to stretch out, continue to stretch out and they'll revert into a ventricular fibrillation or uh, even a ventricular asystole. You may also appreciate axis deviations. I'm not sure if you've gotten into axis yet, so I don't wanna really uh, go into that, but um, uh, it may also precipitate bundle branch blocks or even fascicular blocks. Remember, uh, as we talk about our cardiac physiology, where we have our, our, our left and right uh, bundles where we have our fascicles, where our um, right side of our heart has uh, actually our one bundle or right, one fascicle and our left side breaks into two fascicles, which would be the anterior and posterior fascicle. Okay. Uh, and when uh, those areas get blocked, we term that, of course, a fascicular block. So let's look at, you know, one of the key points I think Chris brings up here 
that is incredibly important is right here where he has starred hyperkalemia. You know, just because your person, your patient is hyperkalemic, they may present with a perfectly normal EKG and still have a potassium of 7.5 to 8. Again, it depends patient to patient how resilient their heart is or whether they, it's going to respond uh, to this high, higher um, serum potassium level. So let's look at, and we have this broken down into, you know, what a mild um, hyperkalemia EKG may look like. Now, remember, we say that in our, in our mild to moderate hyperkalemia, one of the first or uh, one of the findings that we'll see is, you know, this lengthening of the PR interval, and then all of a sudden you'll lose your P waves. So if you look here in leads that you expect to see P waves, especially if we remember uh, lead two is the most sensitive lead for identifying P waves, uh, and we don't see any P waves here. Likewise, we, you know, are starting to see this kind of, the QRS is just starting to widen, okay? So remember that's a, another sign. And our T wave here is, you know, just starting to kind of uh, grow uh, and become a bit peaked, especially we can appreciate that in lead two. And if you move over to your V leads, V2, V3, you start to see these really tall, kind of tinted, uh, um, these tall tinted T waves. And what we have to remember is when we have those tall tinted T waves, that actually stretches out, it'll actually pull on and stretch out for want of a better word, our ST segment, and it will cause our ST segment to elevate. And that's why hyperkalemia is such an effective uh, STEMI imposter, okay? But again, if you look for, let's say, hey, look, uh, you know, I want to know if this is a is a uh, hyperkalemia. Again, you have these tall uh, tinted T waves, and you don't appreciate any reciprocal changes where you might expect to see reciprocal changes if this was an actual STEMI. Okay, so that's a mild to moderate uh, twelve lead, mild to moderate hyperkalemia. Now, as you know, we progress if we don't do something to address it you might find yourself in a situation of severe hyperkalemia. Uh, and here's a classic, you know, 12 lead of severe hyperkalemia where we're starting to see, you know, you've totally lost your P wave, you've totally, you know, your T uh, and your QRS is widened out, just widened out and you get this classic sine wave. You know, you get this classic sine wave. Uh, even, you know, um, this is a classic 12 lead for hyperkalemia. And when you get to this point, um, to say, but you're behind the ball is, you know, is um, putting it mildly. These people uh, usually begin to have ventricular arrhythmias and they're incredibly hard to convert. So, you know, what does that mean? That means that early treatment of uh, clinically significant hyperkalemia is incredibly important. And when we start to say clinically significant, we're talking, you know, you need to start addressing it here uh, at your moderate. Uh, and again, if you don't, if you wait until it gets here, you're well behind the eight ball. So let's really quickly talk about, you know, what things can cause hyperkalemia. Well, patients with a history of renal failure, crush injuries, uh, where you have, uh, all, you know, this uh, lactic acid buildup and not only lactic acid buildup, but when you have injury to the cell, we have to remember that uh, the primary home of potassium is intercellularly. It lives inside the cell. And when you have a crush injury and you have this destruction of cells, these cells kind of lice. And what ends up happening is this uh, intercellular potassium moves extracellular and is outside, you know, in the blood. Uh, and that actually raises the serum potassium. Drugs such as sucks, succedocholine, one of our paralytics uh, can cause hyperkalemia. Salt substitutes, burns, of course, again, uh, with burns, you'll have cellular destruction. 
And with that cellular destruction, that K is released uh, into the uh, totality of the serum. Um, uh, your potassium supplements, rhabdomyolysis, uh, you start to see hyperkalemia. Rhabdomyolysis, of course, is death of, of your muscle and death of your muscle actually uh, is very toxic um, to your kidneys. Uh, and you'll start to see uh, increases in potassium from this muscle, uh, muscular destruction. Now, if we look at the treatment of hyperkalemia, you know, some of this, I'm going to tell you, you know, follow your agency's uh, protocol or clinical practice guidelines. This is uh, the treatment that Chris has here is a generally accepted standard of care when it comes to uh, treating uh, hyperkalemia. But I would say that most of this um, you uh, don't have or will not do or will not get orders to do. Even your high dose albuterol. So if we think about, you know, albuterol in the setting of hyperkalemia, I promise you, you do not have enough albuterol uh, in your drug box to adequately address hyperkalemia. Well, but let me just touch on really quickly, like the physiology. So what actually ends up happening, you know, you put this patient, this patient's uh, typically, if this is the treatment modality that's being used, they're going to put this patient on uh, continuous NEBS, high dose albuterol. Um, and albuterol, actually, we have to remember that uh, albuterol is an adrenergic, uh, adrenergic uh, agonist. And what ends up happening is it causes, you know, this additive effect with insulin. It actually makes insulin more effective and insulin will actually, you know, cause uh, this shift of K from the extracellular space back intercellular. So that's how albuterol works. But again, you probably do not carry enough, or I would say you don't carry enough of it to address hyperkalemia effectively uh, in the field. So what is our treatment you know, designed at? Or what is our treatment designed to do? Uh, what is it aimed at? Well, our, our treatment goal is number one, we're gonna stabilize the cardiac cell membrane. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, uh, we know that um, uh, high doses of, or high levels, serum levels of potassium, very toxic to the heart. The heart doesn't like it. The heart gets really, really irritable uh, and bad things start to happen. So the first thing we do to try to counter that is we want to stabilize the cardiac membrane. And the way we do that is we give this patient calcium. Calcium is what's known as cardioprotective for want of a better, you know, um, visual picture, mental picture, calcium actually kind of puts uh, a shield around the heart and protects it from, or attempts to protect it from this increased potassium, this increased serum potassium. So uh, that's the first thing we're going to try to do is kind of stabilize the cell membrane and protect the heart from this high serum potassium. The second thing we're going to try to do is we're going to try to relocate uh, the potassium. Remember, in this circumstance, we have a high serum potassium. That means we have, you know, the potassium is where it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be within the cell and it's actually extracellular uh, causing this increase in serum potassium. So what we want to try to do is we want to try to push this back into the cell. And the way we'll do that is we'll give the patient insulin and D50. And um, what ends up happening there? Well, insulin doesn't actually uh, move the doesn't move the K intercellular. Uh, the D50 actually moves the K intercellular, uh, but it takes you know quite a bit of of D50 to do that, and uh, it actually kind of helps to carry that potassium across the membrane. And we give that insulin to kind of balance out. To, uh, you know, raising that patient's blood sugar by giving him D50. And then, you know, bicarb is also given. Again, um, follow your local protocol. This is mostly, you know, we're talking in the hospital. For these particular patients, uh, I bet um, most of your protocol is going to tell you, you know, start, in, start a, you know, do a basic assessment, put this patient on 12 lead, do serial 12 leads, 
uh, start an IV and be prepared for, you know, to uh, suppress any arrhythmias or address any um, ventricular arrhythmias that may lead to uh, lethal ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, so first we try to stabilize uh, the cell membrane. Second, we're going to try to relocate that potassium. And third and finally, we'll try to eliminate that potassium from the body. And the way that's done is it's done either through dialysis or something called a uh, uh, PER, which is a potassium exchange resin. Uh, potassium exchange resin, uh, the most common would be k -exalate. And what this potassium exchange resin does is basically uh, it's given and it actually binds with the potassium and the patient just craps it out. Um, now, I will tell you, one of the things that you will not forget is if you are doing an interfacility transfer, you know, maybe with a cardiac patient and the patient's moving from facility to facility and K-exalate has been given, excuse me, but you're going to have a real shit show on your hands because patients given K-exalate, they go and go and go and go and you get this really nasty black sticky, you know, stool that just seems to keep coming. So I'll tell you what, um, one of those times where you really want to maybe light a fire on yourself and really move is if you look or you ask the nurse or the nurse tells you, hey, look, we've given this patient k exalate for hyperkalemia. Um, just be prepared for what will naturally happen next. Okay. All right. Hey, Chris, anything you want to cover here? No, sir. All right. Now, bundle branch blocks, we are going to save for a little bit later. Um, um, because we're going to talk about something called scarbosis criteria. And that takes a little bit of mental horsepower to kind of wrap your head around. And we don't want to, you know, really inundate you today. So we are going to, that will be covered next week. Okay. Uh, I assure you in detail. So you will appreciate uh, bundle branch blocks and be able to identify bundle branch blocks at nauseum. The final thing we want to talk about today um, is something known as uh, Brigada syndrome, okay? And we are not going to spend a lot of time here because Brigada syndrome um, is, you know, if, if I were to uh, put this on my hierarchy of necessity, uh, you know, again, from absolutely need to know to nice to know to know it all, this would follow, you know, I said I would assign colors to it, this would follow, you know, have that green circle by it as this is a know-it-all, you know, someone who has really gone above and beyond and has a lot of time on their hands, which I know isn't, you know, the folks, my audience here, uh, this would be something that they would, you know, look at and commit to memory. But um, the reason why we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it is because, you know, uh, Brigada syndrome is a, a genetic disorder that is very rare. Depending on what literature you read, you're talking about, you know, you'll have uh, Brigada syndrome present in one in every 10,000 uh, cases in the population, or maybe uh, at, at the high end, uh, five out of every 10,000 cases um, uh, in uh, the population. However, uh, it is significant, not because of its incidence, it is significant because of what happens. Uh, Brigada syndrome can cause what's called a sudden death syndrome or a nocturnal death syndrome. Uh, sudden death, I mean, the patient, I actually, many, many years ago, I will never forget, uh, we had this patient when I worked on the cardiac floor um, in transplant, who was an 18 year old female who actually suffered sudden death syndrome um, during her wedding. And she dropped at her wedding and went into a V-fib. Fortunately, there were some paramedics close by and they were able to shock her and convert her. And she was brought uh, to our medical center where she stayed on the cardiac floor for months. And uh, what ended up happening was this is right around, I'm gonna age myself a little bit. This is when what's called AI, an AICD an automatic internal cardiac defibrillator, uh, when this technology was new and they actually you know, implanted this young lady with uh, one of these internal cardiac defibrillators. And I will never forget it because we walked in, you know, uh, the surgeon I thought was really, really cruel and that this lady would, you know, go into VFib for no reason at all or go, go into a VTAC. And 
uh, she would uh, have this tachyarrhythmia and you would hear the AICD go and then boom, and she would jump and it, w- it would cause her pain. And she actually suffered what was what uh, they termed AICD syndrome, which is this anticipation of this AICD going off. And then you kind of get it in this perpetual cycle where this, you know, they're anxious because they think their AICD is going to go off. Um, they're scared that it's going to go off. And then when it does go off, they have this pain response, which leads to tachycardia, which leads to, you know, them going back into uh, VTAC or VFib. And it's, you just get this perpetual cycle. So um, that is why it's, it's so significant is because it can cause sudden death or what would be called nocturnal death syndrome. And again, if we break down that term, nocturnal, uh, nocturnal means night. So, or sleep people you know, who will go to sleep and they don't wake up. Uh, and, you know, for want of a better cause, the doc goes, well, hey, you know, I found this uh, abnormality in the ventricles and we think it was Brigada syndrome. Uh, one of the things about Brigada syndrome, it is, tends to be more common in folks from, of Asian descent. And it is uh, eight to 10 times more common in men than in women. The reason we don't, don't want to get too deep into it is that there are certain flavors, certain types, specifically two types of Brigada syndrome uh, you have type one and type two naturally, and type one is kind of, def- you know, defined as uh, ST segment elevation that's greater than or equal to two millimeters. And you sort of have this kind of downsloping and Chris has this kind of shows this in this, uh, if we look at an example here, you see this sort of downsloping in the ST segment. Um, this is characteristic of Brigada syndrome. And then you actually, so that's that's the first thing. And the second thing you'll notice is you have this inverted T wave. So this is classic of type one Brigada syndrome, where you have this ST segment elevation of greater than or equal to two millimeters, a downsloping of the ST segment, and this inverted T wave. This would be defined as type one Brigada syndrome. Type two, uh, Brigada syndrome has its own characteristics. Again, we start off with characteristic number one, which is, would be an ST segment elevation of greater than or equal to two, two millimeters. And then uh, you look and you have this thing called a saddleback. So if we look right here, like in V1, it's very obvious. You're gonna have Even, to zoom in again, Rana. Sorry. Sorry about that, folks. No, thank you. If you look at most, you know, most prevalent, if we look at V1, we can look at, you know, uh, one, we can look at lead two, but V1 really shows this phenomenon kind of like a, a what's called a saddleback uh, sign. And, and that is just, you know, the configuration or the morphology of the ST segment kind of looks like a saddle. Let's see, what we see there. And then the last part of uh, the criteria for type two is going to be an upright or biphasic T wave. Okay, uh, upright or biphasic T wave. And if we look here, we kind of see an upright T or maybe even a bi- uh, biphasic T wave. Okay, so that is a know it all, um, a know it all topic. Uh, you probably won't see that again on an exam, but just so you know that it is out there. And what's the most significant about it is it can, you know, a person can drop dead from it. You'll go into V-fib just, you know, and these people, I forgot to mention the average age of these people that suffer from Bogota syndrome are, you know, those that are 40, 40 years old and less. The average age is 40, but there's a ton of folks, you know, less than 40 that uh, uh, can suffer from this or do suffer from this. All right. And with that, Chris, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I just wanted to mention, uh, this is actually an example of the uh, so-called channelopathies that I mentioned earlier in, in a prior lecture when I talked about, hey, there are these group of disorders where you have um, genes that code for defective sodium channels and defective potassium channels that alter uh, depolarization and repolarization and Brugada syndrome uh, happens to be 
one of these disorders. I believe Brugada syndrome uh, primarily involves sodium channels. Is that correct, Renell? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. That's yeah. A key and in channelopathy. Fact, yeah. Uh, and in fact, I, I remember. <laughs> I remember this because there was an episode of uh, Scrubs. Anyone ever watched that show Scrubs? Yes. <laughs> and there was, um, oh, he was a, he's a comedian. He, uh, uh, from Indian, Indian descent, uh, from India. Um, his family comes from India. I forget his name, but he, um, he was a, a resident and he was really laid back and didn't study and, you know, just kind of had a lot of fun. And, um, he ends up uh, getting in trouble with Dr. Cox, who's kind of like the uh, uh, the coordinator or the chief. Um, and uh, he assigns this, this new resident uh, some reading material in cardiology and gives him a week. Um, and at the end of the week, he asks him about uh, a disorder that causes widened uh, QRS complexes with ST uh, segment changes that is a... Uh, a sodium channel a sodium channelopathy, and um, the re this resident didn't get it right, and he actually got fired. And I was thinking, oh, they're talking about Brugada syndrome. So, uh, anyway, completely useless uh, knowledge there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, what I want to do is I want to do a little exercise with you all, and um, I'm not going to be able to do it through polling, but what I am going to be able to do is uh, do it through Padlet. So I'm going to do that now. Um, and I just want to see where people are at as far as um, looking at 12 lead ECGs and just getting the basic interpretation of the substantial um, issues that uh, we really want to identify. Um, and again, this is always going to be the, in the context of a history and physical exam, right? So uh, in all of these examples that I'm going to throw up here for you all, I want you to assume that the history and physical exam is consistent with somebody having acute ischemic chest pain. Um, so I do want to throw that caveat in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link in uh, your uh, in the notes, or rather in the uh, conversation here. So I'm going to put a link. Let me do that right now. Let me go back to Zoom. So in the chat, everybody should see a link. All right, that is going to be a link to Padlet. So go ahead and click on that link. And that'll bring you to a blank blue page. And on that page, it says, type your name and interpret the 12 lead. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the first 12 lead up. And then I'm going to give you all a couple of minutes to look at it and to interpret it. So remember, uh, take the systematic approach. I see all leads. Do that first. Inferior, 2, 3, <coughs> septal anterior, lateral, and then think about posterior and right ventricle um, if you uh, suspect they need to be further investigated. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm now going to share my screen with you and I am going to share the first 12 lead. So let me do that right now. All right. First 12 lead is up. All right. So I'm going to give you all a minute or two to take a look at that. Type in your interpretation, and then we'll take a look and see what people are thinking. Got some chat. Yeah, so you go into Padlet. 
And there should be a little plus sign that allows you to Hey, Chris, just letting you know, my internet's slow. It's not letting me go to Pallet. Hey, Chris, just letting you know, my internet's slow. Okay. Um, how about you type it in chat? And just to clarify, everybody can see the, there, it's kind of a, a magenta red circle with a plus down at the bottom right of the screen that allows you to uh, type in your answer. All right, I've got eight. And we got two in chat. All right. Right. It's eight. So we're still still behind a few. So if the rest of you could just go ahead and go okay i think that's about everybody all right so let's go ahead and uh talk about this now so i'll just uh keep the 12 lead up there uh so it looks like pretty much everybody has answered inferior stemmy um okay well let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the 12 lead here so it looks like I think everybody's on the right track. So two, three AVF. So you can clearly see that you've got ST elevation in lead three and AVF that meets uh, thresholds. Remember our, our primary thresholds are greater than two millimeters in uh, a single lead or greater than one millimeter in two or more contiguous leads. Um, so we, in fact, do have an inferior wall STEMI here. And some people have mentioned that there are some changes in leads one in AVL, specifically a little bit of depression. And this is, in fact, a reciprocal change. These are the high lateral leads. And you would tend to see, um, you would tend to see these reciprocal changes in high lateral leads with inferior STEMI. Uh, anyone notice V4? Anyone notice something, anything interesting about V4 there? Inferior. 
carrier. The fours on the right taken from the right side. Yeah, I, I didn't catch all of that, but yeah, this is actually a right sided 12 lead. So they've done a V4R here. Um, so let's see if we can find our baseline. Here's our baseline. And so we're going to draw our baseline through to the J point. And I'll draw it through here. And it looks like just a slight bit of elevation. Um, probably not quite enough to meet criteria for infarction, uh, but this is definitely something we would want to keep an eye on um, because we know that ECGs uh, can be very dynamic. And this is actually something you'd want to do if you're transporting somebody for a prolonged period of time is every 10 or 15 minutes redo the the ecg it's this is called a serial ecg um, and you can actually potentially see this evolve if this is a rapidly evolving situation okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to put another link in for you all and we'll take another look or we'll take a look at another 12 lead ecg so let me do that right now this will be a different Padlet. I'm going to put the link in. There it is. And then I'm going to go ahead and share the second ECG. So let's do that. All right, here is the second ECG. So I'll give you all a couple minutes to take a look at it and uh, interpret it. Uh, type the interpretation into uh, Padlet, um, preferably. And if not, um, go ahead and type into chat and we'll see what people think of this one. Okay, looks like I've got just a couple of people that have uh, posted. There we go, getting a couple more. Uh, looks like we've got some additional chat. All right.
Eleven. All right. And looks like we've got a couple more chat here as well. Okay, just give you a few more seconds here. Uh, let's see, three, six, nine. All right, good. All right. Okay. So it looks like pretty much everybody is uh, thinking the same thing. So let's go ahead and take a systematic approach. So we look at leads two, three, and AVF here. Um, two looks good. Three, there's a little bit of depression there. So that might be some ischemia or it might be reciprocal changes. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we'll just note that and move on. And then um, AVF looks maybe the slight bit of depression there. All right, so that's inferior. Let's move to septal, V1 and V2. You can clearly see a little bit of elevation here in V1. Pretty substantial elevation, the J point in V2. Some pretty substantial elevation in V3, uh, as well as uh, V4. So certainly an anteroseptal STEMI is going on. And then let's look at the lateral leads, V5, V6, 1, and AVL. And we notice we've got uh, some elevation in V5 here. Uh, V6 looks okay. Maybe a slight bit, but not enough to meet any thresholds. Uh, we look at V1, there might be a little bit there. Um, and then AVL, there is a little bit of elevation there as well. So it looks like this is extending into the lateral wall just a little bit. Um, so this is an anteroseptal STEMI with lateral extension, or some people may call this an extensive anterior STEMI. So this depression that we see in lead three, what do you think that might be? What do you all think? Anyone want to guess? Reciprocal. Yeah, that's more than likely reciprocal change uh, due to the um, the uh, the lateral changes. Although it is possible that this could be that what we call a wraparound LAD situation, um, where the LAD is actually perfusing some of the um, inferior um, wall. It could possibly be that, or it could be reciprocal changes. Either way, this is a pretty bad STEMI because a large portion of the left ventricle is, is being involved here. Okay, excellent. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you all uh, another 12 lead. Um, but before I do that... I am going to give you a fresh Padlet to work from. And let me just copy that link real quick. And let me type that into chat. All right, so this is the next Padlet link. And let me give you all another 12 lead. And if everybody does well here and people feel comfortable, we'll go ahead and um, stop it there. And then I will conclude lecture for the day and give you all the rest of the day to work on your 12 lead homework. All right, so this is the next ECG. There we go. And I will give you all a couple of minutes to take a look at it and to um, interpret it and type your interpretation in to preferably Padlet um, or chat if you're not able to access Padlet.
Okay, it looks like about half of you have answered so far. So let's go ahead and just take another minute uh, to wrap this up. Let me check chat here. Okay, that's just me. Thirteen. All right, so we're gonna do uh another thirty seconds. So if you would uh Okay, let's see here. There we go, I think pretty much everybody has completed. All right, so let, I'm just gonna take a look at some of the answers. Uh, lateral, um, bundle branch block, inferior, question mark, ischemia, um, several bundle branch block, Hypothermia, maybe some sort of mimic, brugada, question mark. Uh, so the answers are, there are, see, lateral seems to be a common one. Um, so the answer is a little more, a little more diverse on this one. So let's go ahead and just uh, dissect this particular ECG here. Um, so. I yeah I'll I'll just keep it on here and then um, I do have the um, a, a diagram on the iPad I'm going to go over real quick so uh, let's go ahead and take this systematic approach uh, two three and AVF so we look at lead two here and you see just maybe a slight bit but not enough to meet any threshold um, we definitely have a little bit of elevation in lead three and a little bit of elevation in AVF, right? So we got about a millimeter in both. And so um, I would say that that meets threshold of a millimeter in two or more contiguous leads. So it looks like we're having inferior, right? An inferior STEMI. Then let's move on to the septal. So V1 and V2, um, do I have ST elevation or is there something else in leads V1 and V2? ST depression. So we actually have ST depression, right? So I draw a line through the QRS and you can see that the J point is below the isoelectric line. So this is actually ST depression here. Um, I also have the same in uh, V2 as well as V3. Uh, we look at V4 and V4 looks okay. We look at V5, there's a little bit of elevation there uh, as well as V6. Uh, let's see, we look at one here, that looks okay. And then AVL, it looks like there is some depression there. Um, so we do have an inferior STEMI with um, some lateral, so an infralateral STEMI going on. But what about this depression here? in V1, V2, and V3? What do you all think? What about that depression in V1, V2, and V3? Good mean posterior. Yes, right? Remember, I remember what we talked earlier in the first lecture, ST depression in V1 through V3, particularly in the setting of either an inferior or posterior STEMI, would suggest the presence of a posterior STEMI. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to stop sharing and I'm going to share through the iPad just so I can draw a couple things uh, for you all. There we 
go. All right, so here's that 12 lead again. Let me zoom in on it here. All right, so if you look, and some people were saying bundle branch blocks, and I think maybe what you were, were doing was you were looking right up here and saying, hey, it looks like the QRS complex is uh, maybe a little wide, uh, a little wide going on there, um, which you might be on the right track. Um, and there were some people saying that this is a right bundle branch block. Um, we haven't gone over bundle branch blocks in any sort of detail, um, but you are correct that if you suspect a bundle branch block, you would go to V1 to figure out if this is a right versus a left. Um, and there's something called turn signal criteria that we use. Um, we're not going to do that today so much, but what I really wanted to focus in on was this ST depression here in one, two, and three. Remember, the septal anterior leads are reciprocal to the posterior wall. So the posterior STEMI, the posterior wall isn't looked at directly on a standard 12 lead, but because these leads are reciprocal to the posterior wall, ST elevation in the posterior leads would present as ST depression in the uh, anteroseptal leads, specifically leads V1 and V3, because they are directly opposite of the posterior wall. Um, and we could, not sure that this will let me do it, but we could uh, turn signal this. Let's see if it'll let me. We'll flip it around. Oh, it's not staying flipped. All right, so you're just gonna have to use your imagination. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So you could imagine flipping this around and if and when you do that, you should be able to uh, appreciate the fact that that ST depression looks an awful like ST elevation. See if it's going to let me erase it. It's not. Let's try that again. Interesting technology being a real pain in the butt today. Sorry about that. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, we will. You can clearly see. There we go. At least let me draw on it. So, but you can clearly see if you imagine uh, doing the mirror criteria on that, flipping it around and looking at it in a mirror, this depression would look an awful lot like ST elevation. So this is in fact a posterior STEMI. And so you'd want to do posterior leads. And would you want to also do a V4R on this patient. Let me ask you all that question. Would you want to do a V4R? Yes. It would yeah. hurt. Yeah, particularly because you, you have these subtle, particularly three in AVF, you've got some subtle uh, changes in the inferior leads. And so you'd want to take a look at the right ventricle. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that, Hopefully that made sense. And before I let you all, oh, sorry, is there Chris, a question? Yes. So you said it is a posterior stimuli, but would you would you call it that without doing the posterior leads? No, you'd still want to do posterior leads. 
absolutely. Um, but this is strongly suggestive of posterior STEMI. Um, in fact, I would feel I would feel pretty comfortable calling this a posterior STEMI without doing posterior leads, just because both the both the inferior and the lateral walls are taking a hit. So the two major supplies of blood, um, the uh, the right coronary artery and the circumflex, are involved here and. Remember, most people are right dominant, and then like eighty-five percent are right dominant, and another ten are left dominant, um, and then fifty, and then the, the rest are co-dominant. And in 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 this case, it doesn't really matter because both the circumflex and the RCA seem to be taking a hit. Um, so it is it is, I wouldn't say a hundred percent, obviously, but it is, it is. Um, almost inconceivable that this would not be a posterior STEMI given what we, we see. So yeah, I'd feel really comfortable calling this posterior STEMI um, even without doing uh, posterior leads. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop sharing. I just, uh, I was able to get a bunch of grading done over lunch and um, there were a few few issues that popped up or some consistent issues uh, that I found. And so what I want to do is I want to just pull those assignments. I know we went over the, the answers uh, this morning, but I think it's still going to be worth pulling those back up and going through a couple of them where I saw some issues. So I'm going to do that right now. And I want to make sure everybody is okay uh, because you are going to have, all right, you've got a comprehensive quiz coming up and we'll be doing some quizzes in lab tomorrow. Um, so let me go ahead and share this. Let me make sure everybody can see that. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this one here, um, an uncomfortable number of people called this rhythm SVT. And so I want to, I want to make sure everybody's okay here. Why, why would we not call this SVT? It's it's yeah, the wide QRS complexes. Um, now, I did mention SVT with aberrancy, um, but I said, again, I said, if everything seems to suggest VTAC, error on the side of ventricular tachycardia. Um, and so you've got a wide, complex tachycardic rhythm here. Uh, there are not any uh, easy to identify P waves right? Um, so there is nothing to tell us or to suggest that this is coming from above the ventricles. Now, could it be that there is some uh, co-occurring bundle branch block and that the P waves are, you know, buried? yes, it could be, right? But the more assumptions that we have to make, the more um, what aboutisms, the more, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or what if this was going on? The more assumptions you have to put into an interpretation to make it work, the less likely that that's the, um, the, the interpretation. And that goes into um, something called Occam's razor, where when you are looking at different options, you're looking at different um, differentials, um, the differential that requires you to make the, make the most assumptions is generally not going to be the right one to go with, right? And this is, again, we're, we're speaking um, in generalities here. So this is more likely to be VTAC over SVT, given the available information. Um, let's see, everybody did pretty good there. Uh, and then this last one here got a lot of people. 
So a lot of people, uh, not a lot, but some people call this um, ventricular tachycardia. But can everybody see that you've got P waves here in front of these QRSs? You've got a P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. And then you've got this wide complex with a little pause after it, which is uh, premature. This is a PVC. And then P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. So this is ugly, no doubt, but it's still a sinus rhythm, right? Um, because there is a P for every QRS complex. So the sinus node is in control, except for this complex right here in the middle. The sinus node, the SA node is firing and it is associated with QRS complexes. So this is a sinus rhythm, right? You can easily and clearly identify P waves in front of those complexes. So you have to call this a sinus rhythm um, with a PVC. And of course, the wide complex, the wide QRS in this situation, if the sinus node is in control and you have a wide QRS, then you can be confident in saying that there is a, a bundle branch block or some other pathology that can cause the QRS to widen in the setting of a sinus rhythm. Um, so hopefully that makes uh, sense there. Is there any questions over uh, those? Okay. And then the only other one that I wanted to mention were on the heart blocks. And again, I understand that we've already gone through the uh, answers, um, but I'm going to redux just a couple of them just because I'm seeing some trends uh, coming from the, the heart blocks, the AV blocks. Um, so I had a couple people call this first one here. Um, a second degree type one. So again, what do we need to have a second degree type one or, 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 or winky bar? We, what do we need? Widening P. Yeah. So you need that winky Bach pattern. You need a progressively prolonging P to R interval. And when you look at this, the P to R interval is constant, except where you have a P without a QRS or a drop QRS complex. Right. And that is by definition a second degree type two, not a second degree type one. This, however, you can clearly see the P to R interval getting progressively longer until you have a P wave without a QRS complex. Right. And so this is that Winky Bach pattern. So this is a second degree type one or a Mobitz one. Um, let's see here. I think that is it for the most part, um, yeah. All right, so before we conclude, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions before we uh, conclude lecture? Hey, Chris. Yes, sir. Great question. Yeah, go ahead. So for the homework, do we have to put the um, rate rhythm, is there a P for every QRS or a QRS for every P? And then the analysis? No, no. So for, for today's home, the homework that's due today, no, um, uh, because it is focusing on the 12. So you're really focusing on the, um, the J point analysis of the ST segment. Um, so uh, the homework that's due uh, tonight is going to be um, identifying STEMI primarily. Uh, we also have a uh, one or week one problems. Uh. Yeah, that's right. You, um, that's a, a do, 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 let's see where uh, it's, I don't think that's under quizzes. I think I placed that under homework. Um, the week one problem set is going to be, I believe, 15 different strips. Let me find it here let's see so you've got the STEMI 12 uh, where did it go uh, uh, uh. 
three, four, three. That's why I was just kind of asking if we could, uh, or if you had to add the rate, rhythm, PQRS, PRI, and the analysis. Obviously the analysis. Yeah, Um. so on the 12 lead, no. Um. Hold on here. Four, I'm trying to find that real quick. Comprehensive rhythm strip problem set. Uh, 18 points. All right. So when you click on it, um, do you see uh, my example? There's a little box where I give an example of how I'll just share this. Right. Um, so this is what I want right here. So this little box that I have here. So type the interpretation of each strip. This is what I'm looking at uh, for these. I believe there are 18, 18 strips on this. And these are rhythm strips, not 12 leads. And this is comprehensive for all of the rhythm analysis that we've covered. So hopefully that uh, explains uh, awesome. that. Yes, it does. All right. Okay. Any other questions before we conclude? Hey, Chris, are you gonna upload the uh, these videos today? Uh, yeah, yeah. The the, the first the video from this morning's already up. Sure. All right. Yeah, so uh, it'll take some time for this one to get loaded to the cloud, but I'll have the link as, as soon as it's available. Sweet. No problem. All righty, well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. Let's see, uh, yeah, no problem. Um, any other questions? All right, well, let's, uh, let's conclude. Um, remember, we will have lab tomorrow, so I'll see you all in the, at the college in the labs tomorrow at 9 a.m. And the weather should be much better. Uh, winds are not going to be as big of an issue. So um, and hopefully everybody will have a safe drive over. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Rennell, you have anything? Okay, I'm gonna assume not. So let's just go ahead and conclude. And we'll see you all in the morning. Thank you so much. Bye. Take Thanks, care. Thank, thank, you're welcome. Take care, everyone. Oh, it's cutting my head off. <laughs>